So my name is Xenia, and this is my undergraduate research at Virginia Tech through the Massey Herbarium. So I know this is an FM botanical talk, but I'm gonna do a quick little like history review session, so we're all on the same page. Um, so my talk deals with the coastal, coastal plains of Virginia, and Virginia is highlighted in um, maroon right there. And we're focusing on the colonial times, which is 1600s through 1776. But before the colonial times even existed, we had a lot of Native Americans that would roam through the Americas. And then in um, 1492, Christopher Columbus came and founded America. But the importance of that is that it led to the era of exploration, which is when a lot of European settlers would roam around the world and try to find new trade routes or new lands or people to trade with. So that led to a lot of colonization, such as Jamestown being settled in 1607 in Virginia. And then that led to slavery um, in so here's a quick little map to show you all the different diverse tribes that were living in the coastal plains uh, during this time. So as you can see, they were all just living all together in this land there. And then when the European settlers came, they started defining exactly what Virginia was and like all the different states. So as you can see, Virginia now is like a big triangle, but it was just a blob back in the day. So that's kind of cool to see. And the little arrow shows you where Jamestown is. So I'm pretty sure everybody can guess what three cultures I've studied. <laughs> um, the first one was Native American tribes. We specifically focus on the Rappahannock and the Powhatan tribes, mostly because there was not a lot of written, recorded data from any Native American tribe because their culture is very oral. So they pass stories down through generations, so nothing's really written. So these two tribes we were able to find the most usages, like the most recorded use of plants from them. So they used a lot of herbal plants, also very spiritual aspect, as did the African American slaves. Um, they used a lot of herbal medicine, also spiritually, but the cool thing about them is that they were obviously put in a different environment, so they had to learn a bunch of new plants to use medicinally, which is really cool. And the European settlers, they also used herbal medicine, but then they started to deviate from herbal medicine and try to learn things more about like chemical medicine, like mercury and things like that. So what we did for this project is we compiled a really big list of a bunch of plants that were used medicinally, and we were able to find almost, or I think it was 360 medicinal plants that were used by all three cultures. And then um, we used peer-reviewed literature, databases, and primary literature, such as from the Special Collections at Virginia Tech, that's me. Um, <laughs> so then we categorized all of these plants into 19 different medicinal categories. Um, just for ease. An example of that would be Cornus Florida. It's a flowering dogwood and it's a state plant in Virginia. So it was used by Native Americans as an anti-diarrheal and we would put a little one under the ballast category. That just gives you a little <laughs> example. Um, <laughs> so the next thing that we did is we looked at all of the plants that were native to the coast of Virginia and we did that by using the di digital atlas of Virginia. So this here in orange is the coastal plains there's multiple regions, and we were able to determine around 3,000 species that were native to the uh, coast of Virginia. So then we recorded which culture used what plant, if multiple cultures used more than one plant, if the culture used a plant at all, because there were some plants that are native, but they weren't used medicinally. Um, and then we also recorded if the plant was used, or if the plant was native, introduced, or non-native. And what I mean by that is explain here. So here are some native species that were used medicinally by the different cultures. So Native Americans use American pokeweed, which yes, it is very, very toxic, but they use it for dysentery a lot. Um, and you can actually eat it as well if you prepare it correctly. And then the African American slaves use spotted wintergreen for toothaches, so you can just like chew on it. And then sassafras was used by European settlers as a stimulant. You can actually make root beer out of it. I don't know if any of you have tried it before. I do know that it is slightly carcinogenic in like really large amounts, just an FYI. <laughs> so non-native species means that they were brought in from different parts of the world, different countries, different regions, different states, and were not planted there, so mostly trade. So Native Americans would use nightshade, another poisonous plant, again. They know all the secrets. <laughs> um, they use it as a sedative. African American slaves used goldenrod for fevers, and then ginger was imported from like Asia area for stomach problems by the European settlers. 
And here's some introduced species. Introduced species means, once again, it's not from the coastal plains of Virginia, so it's from a different country, a different region of Virginia, or a different state, but they were specifically brought into the coastal plains and planted there. So now we can find them here, but they're not originally from the coastal plains. So red clover was used to detoxify the blood by Native Americans. Sweet flag was used as uh, pain relief for African American slaves, and European settlers also used wild garlic for pain relief. So here is a little graph of all the 19 different medicinal categories that we recorded. From all of these, as you can see, the African American slaves used the most plants medicinally, um, specifically plants in the other category, and you may wonder what that is. <laughs> So the other category is just things such as colds or poisons, things that can affect multiple parts of your body, like colds affects your head, your throat, your lungs, so it would be kind of silly to like deviate a cold into, like we have a throat category, we have a lung category, so we just put in other, just to make it easier. And we were able to find that African American slaves use about 39% of the plants that we found um, that were used medicinally. Like I said before, European, European settlers were starting to deviate from like herbal medicine, so they were using more chemical medicine, so that's why their number's a bit lower. And then for Native Americans, they were at 32%, and like I said before, it was more difficult to find records of them using plants. Um, and all the records that we found were from European settlers, like anthropologists who dealt with them, but all of these cultures weren't the best of friends during this time, so the records are kind of skinny on that. But a cool thing that we did find was that there was some like cross-cultural transmission. Um, there was 15 plants that were used by all three cultures, and they did use them for the exact same thing, which is really cool, because it's like, did they talk to each other and pass on their knowledge, or did they come to their own conclusions? But it's kind of hard to figure that one out. So the second part of our project was to look at the phylogeny, a bunch of the medicinal plants, so we downloaded DNA sequences for all of the medicinal plants that were used and also all the plants on the coastal plains of Virginia. Um, so that was, like I said, about 3,000 plants and like 360 had the medicinal usages. So we focused on the MAC-K gene, which is from the chloroplast genome, which is pictured here. And we used GenBank, which is a program to do all this. So we're able to make really awesome, cool, circular phylogenetic trees. Um, so this phylogenetic tree shows all of the medicinal plants and coastal uh, plants from all three cultures. So the red ring around, I'm sorry, I do have a laser, I'm not using it. <laughs> so this red ring here is um, all of the plants that have non-medicinal -med properties, and then all of the golden little, little squares are all the medicinal plants. Um, so like I said before, this is about 307 of the medicinal species that are pictured here. So out of the 3,000 species that we have listed out, we only got 2,222, and this is either because not all of the medicinal plants that we found have a DNA sequence done, so we weren't able to download it, um, or there was some problems with some of the names, because either there was like a language barrier or the names that were used back in the 1600s is completely different now. As we know, plant names change a lot. <laughs> So <laughs> that could have been why. So this phylogenetic tree is just the European settlers. So they, we were able to download the DNA sequences for about 114 species. And then this is the Native Americans. Uh, so they had 130 about. And this is African Americans. They had 153 about, give or take. So in other words, we can look at it from the phylogenetic diversity in terms of the bar chart. And as you can see, all three cultures, they don't have that much diversity between what plants they use, which is really cool, because that means on the phylo phylogenetic tree, the plants that they're using are not randomly scattered throughout the tree, meaning that they're pretty related to each other. In other words, you can also look at hot nodes, and a hot node is basically taking one plant and tracing the lineage back to its ancestor. So something happened at the ancestor that made some kind of crazy compound that made this plant medicinal. So this little section of the tree is like, ding, 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 look at me. We're cool, we got some medicinal properties going on. So that's what a hot note is. It stands out from the tree of life because it's special, for lack of better words. So the Native Americans, their bar is a little small. Uh, that may be because the plants that they used were very, very closely related to each other or they used plants in like one or two of the medicinal clays instead of all of the medicinal clays. 
Another cool thing that we found was um, this bar right here, the purple one, that shows all the cultures. So it's more beneficial to look at all three cultures and all the cult like cross-cultural comparison to do that kind of work instead of looking at each culture individually. So here uh, in the gold are all the seven, these are the main seven hot notes that we determined to have a lot of biomedical perspective or potential. Um, so each little golden piece, it has between five and ten taxa, because if it was higher or lower, we didn't count it, because then there would be too many. So an example of a plant that was used by all three cultures was from the nightshade family. This is the tourist Ramonium. It's also called Jimson weed. It is found in Jamestown, and actually on Virginia Tech as well, which is kind of cool, but everyone mows it down, because it is hallucinogenic. Um, <laughs> So it is very, very, very toxic. But the cool thing is all three cultures figured out that they can use it for fevers, which is like, whoa. Like I said, that brings up the question of, did they talk to each other? And they're like, hey, by the way, use this prickly plant for fevers, or did they just come to their own conclusions? Another example of a plant that was used by all three cultures within one of these hot nodes is catnip um, from the mint family, and it was used for gynecologically by all three cultures as well. So in conclusion, if we look at the ethnobotanical properties in the tree of life, we can analyze the cross-cultural potential and transmission between all three cultures around the world, and we can identify the seven hot nodes which have biomedical potential. And all this emphasis, all this emphasizes the importance of preserving knowledge from non-Western cultures or civilizations, especially the Native American tribes, which are slowly diminishing, unfortunately, throughout America. But if we are able to go into the past and look at cultures that have been using plants medicinally for a very, very long time, we can apply this to future medicinal, medicinal development for our future. So they may know a lot of things that we don't, so why not go into the past, bring it forward to the future. Um, we must not forget that medicine does Thank you to uh, <laughs> the herbarium from Virginia Tech. You guys are awesome. And thank you for the economic body section for the travel award. I've never been to Arizona, so thank you guys. <laughs> and does anybody have any questions?